Hi, this is Nick Plizzi from The Sacred Science, and I'm here today with Dr. Kelly Brogan, a New York City-based psychiatrist who is redefining the way we look at depression. She's the author of the best-selling book, A Mind of Your Own. Kelly, how are you? I'm doing wonderfully. So excited to be here with you. Me too, me too. I've been looking forward to this one. So, so your book came out a couple months ago, and it's caused quite a stir. I've, I've heard it talked about in my little circles, and I'm sure that you know, you've had quite a ride so far. Can we just talk about that real quick? Sure. Yeah. So it's, a, it's an interesting thing because the process that I've, I've engaged with this book's production, I guess would be the word, has really helped me to understand that when you come into alignment with something you're meant to do, doors just like fly open, right? Even when it makes no sense that they should, right? So the first door that flew open was that I, you know, that I got this very shocking, you know, the book went to auction and I was very shocking competitive book deal, which blew, you know, blew my mind because I didn't even think I would ever have a single publisher interested in what I have to say. I didn't have an internet platform at the time, um, was a relative no one and, you know, had all of these very, you know, sort of loud mouth opinions about, you know, everything I had learned. So, so that was the first thing. And, and I, you know, got a contract with HarperCollins and they are very used to when, you know, they put seven figures into a book. They're used to waltzing their authors on to the Today Show and Dr. Oz and, you know, 60 Minutes and 2020. And it was, uh, I had told them, I said, you know, I've been involved in activism, uh, pharmaceutically based activism for many years now. And let me tell you what I've understood about the media, you know, and, and who's pulling the strings and, and who's subsidizing the information flow uh, in these mainstream outlets. And they are not going to give me airtime we need a plan B, right? So no plan B was, you know, um, you know, manifest. And it was a month before the launch on March 15th when we got a no from every single mainstream outlet um, in print, um, online, and on TV. And they had never had this experience before. And, you know, I literally got like a tearful call from the publicist at Harper, you know, because of course they see all their money, you know, flowing down the drain, right? And, and I basically, you know, went back to my people, you know, my friends and colleagues. And I said, you know, I'd really love it if it was more than just you guys who read this book, because I feel that we're coming to a really um, pregnant time, you know, in our collective evolution for a readiness to receive this information about, you know, how we should engage human suffering and what, what is the role of medication in that process? And have we been told some, you know, a couple of half truths or lies around um, the role of conventional medicine in navigating human experience? So I said, I really think people are ready. So what do I do? You know, if I can't get this on, on box. Um, and I, you know, I have, I have a large network of, of activists and they see a grassroots movement, you know, where, where one exists. And I just had everyone, you know, go, go to bat for the message. And so that's independent media, you know, it's, it's people like yourself. It's people um, who resonate with a truth and they want to spread the word. And that is, was the poetic, um, I don't know, sort of uh, byline to this experience, which was, you know, my message, of course, is how to to sort of shed so many mainstream concepts about, um, you know, what it is that we're thinking about depression. And so I really had to like shed any reliance on mainstream outlets in order to spread that word. And not only um, was it confirmation that independent media is more powerful than conventional media when the book hit the New York Times bestseller list, which of course was totally shocking to me for a number of reasons, including the fact that the New York Times allowed that to happen. I sort of, I sort of wondered if maybe it just like slipped in there like a couple days after it launched and then nobody actually read the book to know that the New York Times shouldn't probably be supporting it in this way, but considering their funding sources. But um, it's, it's been really fun and very confirming, like I said, you know, that something really exciting is happening and that people are, are waking up at, at accelerated rates and that we can change the way information flows um, throughout communities and even countries, um, you know, with our own language. And it's, so it's, it's been, it's been fun. And I never was worried about it for a moment because I knew that this is, you know, again, how it, how it was meant to unfold. Yeah, good information has a way of finding the right people. Right. Um, so, yeah, in, in a lot of ways, um, our project had 
similar resistance or what we, what we thought would be maybe resistance. Yeah. Um, and it's been amazing to kind of see how, you know, when you stop, even we stop trying to rely on the tele on television or any of the mainstream, you know, news sources, you know, communities really come together. What I wonder is, um, and it was surprising, surprising me when I read your book is this is not how you always were. You were, you were, you were kind of steeped in more of a conventional medical background, you know, and this is, you know, so I, I wonder when I, when I read that, what was the turning point for you? When did you have that aha moment where you're like, Oh, wait a second. This is, I need to rethink everything that, that, you know, was there one, was there one thing that you kind of experienced or did it kind of happen gradually over the course of, you know, a few years? So it's funny because my daughter is seven and she wrote me a birthday card. It's my birthday recently and she wrote me a birthday card and she, about, it was a little book, I guess, about me, right? So a book about Kelly Brogan and she wrote in it all these sentiments like she writes, my mom is a very spiritual, S-P-E-A-R-C-H-W-L-E, <laughs> spiritual person and she guides me on my path and I accept her for who she is and she accepts me for who I am and it was like all these like really intense um almost platitudes and I sort of marveled and reflected on my own upbringing and how these concepts again you know when, when you know better you do better I, I my parents are amazing human beings and they can they continue to play an enormous role in my life but um, they, you know, my mom is an immigrant. Uh, my dad really pulled himself up from the uh, socioeconomic bootstraps and, you know, they did the best they could. But I was certainly raised uh, without any degree of consciousness. You know, I was raised in a very um, binary sort of world of good and bad. Um, I was raised to, you know, worship the holy dollar and to you know, to, in order to achieve what I needed to, um, I needed to apply force of will, you know, so I worked my ass off mostly because I was afraid to, to, to suffer the consequences of ever getting like a B, you know, and that was my motivation. So this is the kind of what I now refer to as like, um, the masculine principle that was really out of balance for me in, in my experience of really the greater part of my adult life. You know, I was like a hustler and a gunner and totally type A and, you know, very much, um, I was like a belligerent atheist, like, you know, I could have, you know, been Dawkins, like, uh, you know, PR woman, you know, I just, I really, I really thought, you know, science has cracked the code of everything there is to know. And if it hasn't, then just hold tight, because we're about to get there, you know, and, and when I became a doctor, it really felt like, well, we're, you know, perfect health is just one prescription away. And we're very close to the perfect randomized trial that's going to you know, give us the information that we need. And, you know, it's just the human condition. We're born this way and we just have to manage the bad luck and purposeless findings that arise in, in these very flawed bodies, right? Um, so because people never change their minds through science and they never change their minds through information, they really only ever change their minds, in my opinion, through experience. Um, it was my lot, you know, to, to have my own health crisis as is the case with almost every turncoat physician, you know, they've had their own, um, experience of the gross limitations of the model. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, I developed a autoimmune thyroid condition after my first pregnancy and I had been specialized at that time in writing prescriptions for pregnant and breastfeeding women, psychiatric prescriptions. That's what I did for a living. Um, and I remember, you know, sitting with a pregnant patient, I was pregnant myself and writing her a prescription for Zoloft, which, you know, after sitting with her and her husband and going through the 25,000 cases in the literature that basically are reassuring of the fact that her baby wouldn't be born with extra fingers or toes and probably it's fine. Um, and I remember having this feeling like I would never want to take this medication as a pregnant woman. And it sort of like jarred me, right? Cause here I am writing these prescriptions every single day and this dissonance was arising. And I just totally ignored it because I had no tools to you know, engage it. And so it wasn't until I developed that um, illness and, and was like formally diagnosed that that same voice came up and I was like, well, I don't want to take a prescription for the rest of my life, this sucks. You know? So I had the strange sense to consult a naturopath, which was so unlike me, I was so derisive of you know, anything but you know, the formal model of conventional medicine. Um, and she told me, you know, to, to change my diet primarily, gave me some supplement recommendations, started to talk to me about things like exercise and breathing, you know, which I'd never made time for. 
or even thought had any value, frankly. Um, and I put into remission a chronic illness that you're not supposed to be able to put into remission, right? And so this was a red flag for me like none other because it really invited me to question everything that I had learned if this very foundational premise, you know, that chronic disease can be put into remission through lifestyle change. I mean, this flew in the face of everything I had learned. So I started to turn over stones. I turned over stones, you know, because I had a baby at that point um, around antibiotics and vaccination and around food production and started to look at um, every medication I had ever prized. I took birth control for 12 years. I took, you know, myself, I took beta blockers because every once in a while I get like a heart rate that would bother me. Um, I would take, you know, anti-anxiety medicine like Clonopin when I felt like it or was having trouble falling asleep after call. You know, it's just like a very loose and limber relationship to chemicals that I had to revisit now because um, it was only in the idea of having a lifelong marriage with the chemical that I began to feel discomfort that obviously was in there somewhere. And, and I, you know, and so that was the end. You know, that's when I began to understand patterns in pharmaceutically based medicine that I still uphold today and why I actually have come to the pretty radical perspective that there's no role for pharmaceuticals in human health. And, you know, I, I know I tend to be a bit of a zealot. Um, I have that streak, but I will stand by it and I will show you, you know, if you want to use the language of basic science, we, it, we can do that. You know, I have, I have a lot of questions about whether or not we should even be relying on that to help navigate us anymore, but I can show you, you know, primary literature that would help you to question whether you should be taking Tylenol or Zoloft or Prilosec or a statin or taking an antibiotic like z -Pak, you know, for your bronchitis, um, just to sort of help broaden the conversation. So it's really sort of um, spread into every crevice possible. And, and it, of course, was the beginning of my, my own personal journey, which has unfolded only after I healed myself physically. So, so why depression? You know, a mind of your own is, is focused, I mean, primarily on depression, yes. although there are a lot of little offshoots that make you realize that, you know, everything might be linked to the same, to the same cause. But why yeah. depression specifically? Right. So, so what you're saying is very true because the illusion of these different diseases being different diseases um, is one that I'd like to myth bust, you know, up front. You know, is depression really different from any other physical illness in that it's just a message that there is a source of imbalance to be examined, right? Um, but depression, I think I wanted to reach the most people I possibly could with my credentials, quote unquote. Uh, and the truth is that, you know, 11% of Americans are taking psychotropic drugs, one in four women of reproductive age are. Depression is the leading cause in the world of disability, according to the World Health Organization. So I couldn't, you know, I couldn't pick a heavier hitter. Um, and it also happens to be one that, that touches the very core of major questions we have to begin asking about our orientation towards our bodies and our um, real lack of acknowledgement that there's anything beyond the body in all of conventional medicine, you know, that there is such a thing as, um, you know, a soul or spirit is something that, you know, despite the fact that psychiatrist actually means doctor of the soul, it couldn't, it couldn't be more um, divorced in a really Cartesian way, you know, from, from any acknowledgement that there is any role for experience, right? Everything is management and uh, functionality and, you know, punching the clock and staying um, productive. So it, it happens to be a subject that really lends itself to, to looking at these bigger issues, which I think do uh, manifest in other physical illness as well. One, one of the spookiest things that I've ever, I've ever encountered was two, two very close friends of mine, you might even call them fam, very close family members, um, got divorced. And mm -hmm. when they got divorced, they were, you know, the first thing that their, that their psychologists did was to refer them to a psychiatrist to prescribe them some kind of an antidepressant. It's a perfect example. And, and, and there wasn't, and these are very smart people and they both did it. They both took it. And because, you know, I think that there is sort of this, we just do what our doctors tell us to do. I mean, you're, you're, it's just the way that we, we were raised. If the doctor tells you to do something, then you give it a shot. You know, unless, unless you, you know, you experience, like you said, like a transformative illness of your own where you have to find other ways. So you don't really ever come to that conclusion and you just do what your doctor tells you to do. These people both took antidepressants and started fading away. Like, you know, they were, yeah, they weren't, they weren't like, they weren't like crying or like, you know, and, you know, 
curling up in the fetal position, but they were also not themselves. They were gone. They were basically just gone for a couple months until I started my, and my, my sister started, you know, both being like, Hey, um, what the hell is going on? Like, are you, yeah. kidding me? you don't know, you're, you're really doing this to yourself right now. So, I mean, the fact that this is not, um, this wasn't a chronic condition. This, this, this wasn't even a chronic condition. This wasn't even, this wasn't nothing. This was just a life circumstance that they were prescribed medicine for. Yes, it's amazing. You know, I love that example because it really illustrates what we're dealing with here. You know, there, there's recent data just now that echoes previous data that suggests basically most prescriptions for antidepressants are written by non-specialists and so mostly family practice doctors and GPs, internists, and that more than half of prescriptions are written not for depression for like dog dying, for divorce, for circumstantial experiences. And listen, doctors, for the most part, I have to believe are not bad people. You know, this is the tools that we were given to ease struggle and suffering. We want to fix it, right? That's part of the problem is the whole mentality of conventional medicine is fix it, fix it, fix it. And so, you know, a divorce is challenging. You know, if, for many people, it's like a birth canal, you know, to, to a new you, to your next chapter. And if, if everything is co-conspiring around you to, to essentially say like, don't go there, that could hurt. Or don't go there, like that could actually interfere with work. Or don't go there, you have shit to do, you know, you don't have time for that. Then when somebody offers you a hand in the form of a prescription, you know, how could you not take it? Why would you not take it? And part of my mission, um, you know, it has really been to, to focus on some of the almost sensational sounding uh, concerns that I've developed after a deep dive into the literature, which include the fact that taking an antidepressant prescription um, can actually change the course of your life and the lives of other people within days of your first dose. You know, I got an email the other day uh, from a woman who wants to, you know, make her, her presence known to me. And she said, my husband um, never suffered from depression in his entire life. He was not a psychiatric patient. He was struggling with insomnia, circumstantial insomnia, and his internist prescribed him an SSRI antidepressant, and five weeks later, he was found dead hanging in his garage. So she's pretty upset about this, right? And to her, it's pretty clear the causative relationship between that medication and her husband's death. And guess what? People shoot up schools, they take down airplanes, they kill their babies and their children, they murder their spouses, they behave in heinous ways that human beings like to a person would never ever consider engaging if not for being under the influence of uh, you know such an altering chemical that we have barely characterized what it does so if it were the magic pill we are told it is and you know and I was in my training you know that's safe and effective and a quick fix like of course why would you not take it but the problem is we are we are representing it in a way that is wholly inconsistent with what you know, the medical literature is telling us are its attendant risks. And then we're not even grappling with the bigger picture question of, is there a role for sitting in your experience? Is there a role for witnessing your experience? Is there actually a purpose and a meaning personal to you for the types of, you know, suffering that you're exposed to? You know, that we, you know, we can't even have that conversation, right? Other than places like this. So it's, it's a complex issue and I appreciate your, you know, highlighting that element of it. I read um, an article that you wrote, um, I think it was in early May for Madden America that I was just like enamored, enamored by. Um, I think it was called, is it called um, An Honor of Pain and Fear? Fear, yeah. yes, yes. Um, and I was just like, oh my gosh, this is so good. It's, it just, it jives so well with like uh, the, the medicine path that we kind of speak yeah. about a lot here. It's just using your, your suffering as a portal to, you know, uh, you know, your, your own evolution. And I'd love to kind of talk about that because that sort of does seem like it's the logical, you know, alternative to taking an antidepressant is being, is stepping up to your life and being like, Hey, I'm going to be here and I'm going to do the unthinkable and actually welcome this in and surrender to it and let it teach me something. Right. Right. So it, I think in that article, I even mentioned Robert Whitaker, who's the investigative journalist who, who has that platform out in America, whose book, Anatomy of an Epidemic, I should mention, completely changed my life uh, because when I read it, I was exposed to basic literature that I'd never, ever seen in the entirety of my very expensive, you know, Ivy League training. And uh, none of it was industry-funded literature. And essentially what it argued for was the very seemingly controversial assertion 
that taking medication for any psychiatric illness actually in the long term uh, makes you worse off, mm -hmm. right? So you would be better off never taking a stimulant, never taking a mood stabilizer, mood stabilizer never taking an antipsychotic as a schizophrenic, okay? Really? Never taking an antidepressant. Never, no, no, he leaves no stone unturned and he goes after every medication and he shows the naturalistic data that does exist, you know, you could poke a lot of holes in it, but it, it, it does exist, that shows like, what do these problems look like before we started meddling, right? Like, shouldn't you know what a disease is before you start treating it? Probably, right? So, you know, he goes back to literature in the 50s and 60s that actually watched the course of depression, really serious, debilitating, bed-bound depression, right? Um, and actually found that within a year, up to three quarters of cases, if not more, spontaneously resolved with no intervention, okay? So it doesn't happen in a week, it doesn't happen overnight, but there's a course, there's an arc, right? So we don't allow for that, you know, we don't allow for that with any illness. There's no, you know, trust in a natural process being necessary. And listen, I'm still trained conventionally, I still wear that hat of wanting to help and do and, support and and I can't say that what I do with my patients is let them sit there you know when they come to me um, in their deep deepest darkest night and just I just sit there with a Buddha smile and let them go through it I mean it's not what I, I do either because I actually do believe that for many of us in this very um, tr transitionary time in human consciousness I believe that there is such a, a need for bodily inhabitation and relationship to your body and trust of your body and we have to sort of get back in there, get grounded in that way before we can emerge. Um, so I do focus a lot on nutrition and you know detoxification of the environment and, and evolving your relationship to the natural world, etc. Um, but I can't. But I would have to acknowledge that if I did none of those things, they would probably be fine if they had the consciousness to support it. Right. So you know, again, I never used to think this way. I mean, I was somebody. I had two natural births, one home birth, and I was somebody who before that, you know, used, I remember thinking, if I ever have a kid, like, why would you not have an elective cesarean? That makes no, why would you experience pain when you don't have to? It makes no sense. It's like an act of masochism, right? But this is the mentality of someone who doesn't appreciate um, that there is an embedded spiritualism and an embedded intelligence and design um, to this entire experience that relates us necessarily um, to every other person and every other, you know, sentient uh, and non-sentient sort of entity out there, that it's a web, right? Um, and, and part of spiritual evolution is just becoming aware of that web. I mean, that's all that's actually happening. It's like a remembrance of that web. So when you feel the hold of that web, then you can trust that there is some meaning or purpose or significance to struggle and suffering, right? Not many of us. And listen, I have some friends who are spiritually, you know, awakened and oriented who actually don't believe that suffering needs to be a part of enlightenment, right? I actually would counter that I think for most of us it does because we are now several thousand years, maybe 10,000 years into a mentality um, that is like a no pain, no gain, right? Whenever we began engaging with the earth in an agricultural um, mindset, you know, where you had to, 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 to um, sow to reap, you know, or it was like invest now to get later, this whole um, sort of trust in the, in the infinite abundance of the earth was shifted, right? It was became more of a managerial relationship. And I think that has really permeated our psychology to the extent that most of us who have grown and taken quantum leaps in our own development have done so through suffering, through loss, through death, you know, through unforeseen horrific circumstances um, that, you, that you chose not to resist and that you actually emerged out from the other side of, right? Most of us don't have like an amazing wedding with a beautiful party and feel transformed. You know, it's just not, it's not the way I think we're configured at this moment in human history. So it's only when you can um, begin to appreciate that there is something else driving the, the car other than you, <laughs> you know, um, that you can begin to say, well, maybe there's something in this for me. Right. So, you know, I had a number of very challenging experiences, not the least of which was the very sudden death of my mentor, who was like a soulmate to me, um, Nick Gonzalez, 
um, last summer. And I, you know, really was brought to my knees in the way that a very shocking type of loss often does, right? Where you realize there ain't nothing you can do and you can either say no, 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 no till, you know, you're blue in the face or you can understand that there is nothing you can do and you just have to let it wash through you. And so that was a very profound experience with um, understanding that there are tools that I could engage to help me remain open to something that just made me want to close, 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 close. And that's, you know, when I really got much deeper into the practice of Kundalini Yoga and what's really sort of taken me from there in terms of um, exploding my consciousness. But I think sort of one of the best analogies around this um, idea of the role of suffering is this sort of story, I guess, uh, that one of a healer, Joseph Aldo, in, uh, who's out in Brooklyn here, um, told me in a group, you know, we were all talking about this sort of thing. And he read the story of, of this guy, right? And he's watching this caterpillar in a chrysalis, right? And, and it's like struggling and struggling. He just sees it like struggling inside. And there's a tiny, tiny little hole like where it theoretically would emerge from, right? And, and so he just feels so bad, you know, watching this. And he thinks, well, look at me. I'm this big man. I could do something about this, right? And so he takes a pair of scissors and he snips the chrysalis, right? To, to, to let, you know, the, the butterfly out caterpillar turned butterfly out. Um, and what happens is that the, the, the butterfly emerges but is incompletely developed and can't ever fly and eventually dies, right, without ever, you know, um, ever reaching the air. And it's such a poetic illustration of how when we interfere with so many of these processes, be they physiologic like a human childbirth, for example, or psychospiritual, um, like, you know, an experience of loss, you really stunt um, your development and, and, and you really interfere with what it is that you could um, engage or enter. And so until we create a space for this kind of suffering and we all hold it together so that when somebody is going through something like a divorce, um, we all say, you know what, I know you really feel like you need to do something right now to make it better. You know, whether that's get on a medication, you know, have a drink, um, whether it's like, you know, make, making a, the phone call you shouldn't be making or shooting off an email. I know you feel that way, but just sit in it, mm -hmm. sit in it. And I'm going to just sit here with you. That's it. I'm not going to give you advice. I'm not going to help you fix it. We're just going to sit in it. I'm going to hold space for you to just be in it because it always transforms if you don't resist it. I mean, philosophers since the beginning of time have been trying to tell us that resistance is the pain, right? Um, and, and if you can just understand what it is not to resist, that's taken me a long time. I'm still in the process of understanding what that means. So I don't pretend to be an expert by any means, but I do know that there is a deep, deep, deep value and it's maybe our only way out of, of sort of the, the mess we're in right now is to appreciate this concept. So many questions from what you just said. I mean, for the first being, you know, this early, the earlier on in your answer, you, you mentioned that, you know, this is really part of our birthright as kind of an agrarian society. But I, I see, I see planned suffering in tribal cultures, you know, I mean, you know, rites of passage are there to teach yeah. and they are definitely not comfortable. I mean, I don't know if I, if I know of one rite of passage that is, is comfortable. Pleasant, right, right. There's no, they're not sweet, sweet 16s, right? Exactly. <laughs> So, I mean, I think that even in these societies that were sort of living off of the, you know, the earth and, and kind of, you know, I guess, outwardly carefree. You're right. They still had these rights that you have to go through to um, kind of get to the next stage of your development. There were just really no choice if you wanted to kind of be, I don't know, accepted or, or feel like you're part, you're a contrib contributing member of the tribe. So... I, I, I might have been in the same article or possibly in your book, but you mentioned the death of the rites of passage, you know, the death yeah. in our culture. And um, it's something that we're really excited about, something that I've written about before and, and continue to write about. And I'd love to get your perspective on that. Yeah, so it's exactly what you're saying, you know. So um, there, there is this, this sense of having to prime, sort of like prime the pump, you know, right? And that it can be done uh, consciously and, and uh, even with some degree of temporal expectation and anticipation so that the whole community knows that it's coming. 
And so this is almost, a, a, it's almost actually a gentle way to engage um, technologies of ritual and initiation because when, in tribal culture and literally on every continent, you know, like you said, I mean, every, um, you know, from, from African tribes to Native Americans and beyond, there has been a um, sort of like tribal and community acceptance for the importance of um, priming consciousness in this way. And so, you know, obviously, I, as I wrote, I mean, it's my sense that women have um, this built in ritual, you know, of, of, of potential childbirth. And honestly, even if it's not engaged in that way, um, often there is a surrogate experience for, for many women, right? But childbirth is in all of its stages, um, you know, including the like someone has written about the four stages of childbirth as reflecting any kind of evolution of consciousness where, you know, there's this sort of like dark, comfortable ignorance, right? And then you sort of like enter the canal and you want to go back up. <laughs> you know, it's like very uncomfortable and you begin to feel the squeeze and you don't see the light mm -hmm. uh, yet. And so there's hopelessness and a feeling of almost a death and a loss and a departure from where you want to be. And then you sort of begin to see the light and you understand that there's work you have to do to get there. And then you emerge, you know, individuated um, or self-actualized in, in this important way. And so, you know, many of these rituals sort of have that form where you have to move through a test of so many of your beliefs about yourself, your potential, your trust in, you know, the fact that what is intended to unfold for you will unfold. And my understanding from a lot of these rituals is that sometimes people actually did die, you know, sometimes they actually were, um, you know, that perilous, you know, having to like personally um, kill a lion, for example, you know, as an African ritual and it involves like yanking your tooth out or a vision quest, you know, out in the wilderness with nothing, you know, for, for three days. Um, my, one of my favorites is, you know, cutting off and eating your own foreskin. So listen, maybe we have nothing to complain about here when we <laughs> <laughs> encounter our struggles. Uh, but, but just like childhood um, illnesses, you know, that now we have considered so anathema to, to uh, natural human existence, um, childhood illnesses like, you know, measles or even chickenpox, um, to some enlightened pediatricians actually have a role in priming the immune system and educating it about self and other so that later you don't struggle with things like allergy and autoimmunity, right? And you're not totally destabilized by a tick bite or Epstein-Barr virus, right? So maybe when we can use uh, ritualized initiation and you know, controlled experiences of suffering, we are better immunized in a natural way you know, for what comes later and we recognize internally that, oh yeah, I felt this level of hopelessness and fear before and everything was fine. You know? So I think it might be again, you know, and that's why I've really connected, and one of the reasons I've really connected to Kundalini Yoga is because um, you know, having done vinyasa for 20 years and never really gotten much in the way of enlightenment out of it, um, you know, when I have my, you know, arms above my head for 62 minutes and after the third minute, I feel like there's no possible way I'm, I have another, you know, hour in me. Um, and I push through what my mind is telling me about how I can't do this, even telling me something like catastrophic could happen if I continue. Um, I push through that, then you actually engage this relationship with your own um, psyche that frees you for the next time you actually experience struggle or suffering in real life, uh, and you feel like more prepared, more prepared. You know, a lot of the breath work in Kundalini Yoga, for example, is extended exhale holds, right? Try it. You know, try holding your breath out for 30 seconds, and you'll, you'll literally feel like you might be on the verge of your own death. Mm -hmm. So... There's something really valuable in, in exercising and flexing that muscle because then, you know, if something unexpected or shocking happens, and I have to say, since beginning the practice, like nothing, nothing tweaks me, like nothing stresses me out, nothing bothers me. Even if shitty things happen, I understand that not only can I deal with it and manage it, but there's probably not much I have to actually do, and I just have to just be in the experience the best I can. Yeah. So it begins to sort of train your muscles, so to speak, around it, and we're not doing that as a culture. We're not, and we're running from it. Oh my God. I mean, looking at the medicalization of birth, you don't even have to look any farther to see how far and fast we're running from, from this birthright. 
So do you, do you feel that we, because we tend to, as a culture, take a pass on most of these, you know, life challenges, do you feel like that's made us spiritually soft or, or our resolve, our core, our spiritual core, somewhat soft in relation to other cultures that maybe do let these things kind of happen and not take a pass? That's a pretty euphemistic way to put it, because I actually would go so far as to say that we have been forcibly divorced from any uh, sense of spirituality. And I can say that from experience, having lived the way that I did for 30 something years, you know, mm -hmm. and it's all part of this, again, like Newtonian, Cartesian, 300 years of science that have built this sense of spirit being out there, not in here. Even modern religions are predicated on this notion that the body is a source of carnal sin and spirit is up there floating with God in the ethers, right? Mm -hmm. Like there is, a, there is a perspective where there is a, an embodiment of spirit in and throughout everything, in a cell, in one cell of our body is, is spirit, right? So, um, and that's more like the animism perspective. We are so, so far from that that this is, you know, no small part of why we are being delivered these invitations, I'll say, um, to get closer to, you know, get closer to God and get closer to a sense of um, less, you know, purposeless existence. Um, like where, as Alan Watts would say, like we're just like, you know, flesh robots floating on a dead rock. I mean, that's essentially what we've been led to believe. And it's, of course, anything but the truth. But, you know, depression in this way um, is an invitation to examine what you do believe about your experience. Like, and will you, will you accept the invitation to look at what this struggle is about? I actually think every physical illness, including infectious disease, is, is brought to a person. And God, is this, is this um, you know, material for... for uh, my critics, but I actually believe that every single um, experience of ill health is a personally designed invitation. Uh, and if you don't resist it, you will go exactly where you need to go with it. It's in the resistance of it. It's in taking antibiotics for your infection. It's in getting chemotherapy for your cancer. Um, it's in taking an antidepressant. It's in getting that epidural. And listen, I know I push a lot of buttons and I understand because I used to believe all of these things were totally essential and, and worse, that you would be irresponsible not to engage them and that the government should actually forcibly um, you know, make sure that you do. So I get it, uh, but I've come to understand that there's no free lunch. And listen, if you look at, any pharmaceutical product, you'll see a pattern, right? You'll see that there is a story about a problem and that there is a lot of fear around the support of this problem, right? That this story that we're being told about what's wrong. And then there's a product that's going to fix the problem, right? But what happens amazingly is that the, the product actually ends up causing the very problem that we are told it was solving, right? So you could look in Whitaker's book and, you know, and on Madden America, and you could find evidence for every single um, psychiatric medication actually causing depression in the case of antidepressants, causing relapsing psychosis in the case of antipsychotics, causing mood instability over time, causing in inattention after two months of a stimulant, causing rebound anxiety in the case of a benzodiazepine, they're causing the very problems that they promised to resolve, and that's because the problem never existed in the way that they said it would. And that's true for antibiotics, which disrupt your immune system so that you actually end up developing infections that you were hoping to cure with your uh, antibiotic. You know, you, you could look at acid blockers that induce a state of such sensitivity to, to aberrant acid production that you wish you never took it in the first place. And the same with painkillers and the same with vaccines. I mean, it's the same with every single pharmaceutical product where we've just bought into a myth, um, understandably so. And, and, and the sooner we can disabuse ourselves of the false promises, um, the sooner we can begin to understand how to navigate this uh, human experience in a way that will leave us feeling so much less fear so much less fear and so much more, you know, native trust in the process and also an ability to navigate towards the kinds of people who will help us to uphold the, you know, incubation of a very different kind of consciousness. I love the idea that, that, that illnesses come to us um, as sort of messengers or teachers 
one of the one of the traditions that we work with from the Amazon um, looks at diseases as mothers. They actually call them mothers. Yes. yes. They say that you know you you the disease becomes pregnant with you, and if you oh, in the womb of the of the mother gets you know if you listen and learn, then you'll be you'll be rebirthed anew. If you don't, then you'll be rebirthed, but just not back into this life into the next one. Um, but these are these are matriarchal cultures, you know. I think that's sort of maybe at the some sort of an, uh, sort of a kind of an underlying theme that we're starting to kind of talk more about with, on the sacred science. And I, I wonder how you feel about is just the idea that this that kind of this patriarchal society we live in. And I'm not saying that men are bad. Obviously, I am. No, also, no, it's not. But, it doesn't mean but, that. Yeah. But, but the thinking, the thinking that that you know it, it helps. It's it's helped in a lot of ways. It's done amazing things. Um, but in a lot of other ways, it's failing us miserably. And I just wonder, wonder what, how you feel about that. Yes. Yeah, so I actually um, feel very strongly about that issue because I, again, identify as having, having I, you know, operated from my masculine principle for a long time. And I can, in ha I was a feminist. I've been a feminist my whole life, you know, but I was a feminist who, who believed that the HPV vaccine was the a gift to women that entitlement to birth control was, you know, the greatest thing. And that elective cesarean is something that every woman should consider. Right. So this is the kind of feminism, which is like, you know, how do I suppress and strip every aspect of my um, womanhood so that I can compete on par with the masculine principle and all the men out there. Um, and it's very much a gender, um, you know, non-specific problem, right? Because there are so many, I would say most men today who have so little contact with their feminine principle that they have only the tools of, you know, dominance, mastery, uh, productivity, sort of, um, you know, aggression, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, and and they, they don't have the tools that they too need, you know, to integrate their own experience. So this doesn't have to do with men or women. It, we each embody both, as you know, both principles, but it's about balance. And so, you know, my estimation, and, and based on a lot of my reading, um, including a wonderful book I really loved um, by, by Vicki Noble called Shakti Woman, which is essentially talks about there being, you know, four to 5,000 years now of um, non-tribal living, right? So, so where we have, you know, begun to domesticate um, the land and ourselves in a way that has supported the simultaneous evolution of a type of consciousness that really um, was based on separation. So separation from each other, separation of uh, body from spirit, separation of us from nature, and that that is considered sometimes a masculine dominant principle and a, a patriarchal model. Uh, and now that we're beginning to be pulled back to what is called in another wonderful book by Leadloff, the continuum concept, right? We're beginning to be called back to what over several million years of evolution is, is embedded in form of an expectation, you know, for our mind, body, and, and soul to have a certain experience as we come into this world, right? And she really focuses on in arms contact as an infant for six plus months, you know, until you crawl nonstop. Okay. So there's the whole like attachment parenting movement, but, but there's some, um, there's something real there, right? Because if you don't actually have the expected experience that tribal people, you know, she followed a South American tribe for several years and found that they stuck their babies on their bodies and walked through rivers and rain and jostled them around. Everyone's noise all over the place. And that if you don't have that expected experience, then you spend the rest of your life seeking to fill that hole. Right, seeking to ease that sense of something missing, and that it's hardwired within us, right? So, so literally, probably opiate level wiring. She talks about how heroin is often, you know, people people abuse uh, many drugs, but specifically opiates, in in an effort to soothe that um, wound, right? So, you know, you, then we end up seeking these what are what are called secondary satisfactions. So, whether it's you know drugs or power or sex or money, and it's a black hole that you can never fill. Uh, because the primary, you know, source of satisfaction was totally um, sidestepped early on. So I believe that that's what's happening right now, uh, is that we're being sort of called back to something that we couldn't have strayed too far from, uh, but that we sort of needed to, you know, my, my 
friend Charles Eisenstein is a is a philosopher who's who's written brilliantly about this subject. You know how how the idea is not to revert back now to old ways. You know the idea is to incorporate the best of how we have grown, but to apply it with a very different consciousness and a consciousness that seeks to uh, allow nature its ultimate fulfillment. You know rather than um, seeking to dominate it and and to lord and master over it as as humans, right? It's just a mindset shift, and then that mindset shift will allow us to understand how to move forward. Because it's like Einstein says, like you can't use the same tools, um, you know, the same consciousness that got you into this problem to solve it. We have to. We don't even know what the solutions look like. We have no idea. I mean, that was a big sort of birthing process for me around my activism because I became really as is very commonly the case, you know, and why I, I actually, you know, was very helped by Charles's work is, you know, you can get to a point of feeling really bleak. Like I'm just one person, what I'm doing isn't working. Everything is so messed up. You know, why did I bring kids into this world? It's never going to get better. You know, there's fluoride in the water and medication everywhere and glyphosate in the rain. And now what, you know, and, um, the truth is that you have to shift and, and, and work on your own um, experience. Uh, and that's actually, if we each do that, then that's actually, you know, the soil from which um, the next story will grow. So I don't even think we can see it yet because we're just in that process of honoring, you know, how to get in, into our own psychospiritual alignment. So it, it, just to go back to the, the one in four women are, are using some kind of medication to to control their mood and, and you know emotions. If there's if you're somebody who's watching this right now and you realize, oh yeah, I'm one of I am one, that one and part of that one in four. Like, but you don't have access. They don't have access to you. What do you do? I mean, how do they? How, you know, what's what's a safe and reasonable way for them to take a step in the right direction? You know, I'm so people, glad you're asking this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Right, because sometimes I can do this, right? And we didn't even get too into it because I can, I, can, <laughs> I can share all sorts of scary stuff about antidepressants that would make you never want to touch one for the rest of your life. But, um, but the truth is that a lot of people are taking them. I mean, I would sit at, at meetings in, in HarperCollins and half the women at the table talking about my book we're taking antidepressants. So it's yeah. the nature of it. I've done countless interviews, you know, um, again, with independent journalists for and, and media for this book. And almost every time, I would say, with very few exceptions, uh, people have personal questions for me after the interview about someone they know or their experience. This is such a pervasive problem. I mean, the, the statistic is 11% of Americans. I don't buy it. It has to be something more like 50%. It has to be. Um, who, who are taking psychotropic medication. So there's a good chance that people listening are. So I would, I would say this. The first thing is you have to decide what story feels true to you, right? So, so let's just be reductionist to talk about two stories. So one story is you, you were born with, you know, genes that are going to determine what kind of person you're going to be in this life. Um, your body is inherently flawed and, and really, you know, like a bit of a minefield in terms of the things that can go wrong in your human experience. And there are probably going to be situations where you just need to accept that pharmaceutical products are going to be a part of your life and you just need them because otherwise bad things can happen. Right. So, so that's one model, but then there's a, another model that that is the one we've been speaking about, right? Which is that actually genes determine very little um, relative to environmental and lifestyle influences of about our, uh, physiologic experience of health, right? That actually the body doesn't make mistakes. And when it's reacting, it's reacting for a reason. And we need to learn the language of communication with it to understand why it is that we're sick in the ways that we are. Um, that there's actually tremendous power, maybe superior power in lifestyle medicine relative to pharmaceutical medicine if you just dedicate yourself to it exclusively. Um, and, you know, there's probably some reason that this is your journey. Okay, so that's a totally different mentality. So you have to sort of see which is yours. Because if the former is, then you probably should just stick with what you got. You know, you pro there are plenty of doctors, wonderful. I have so many conventional doctor friends. They're amazing, lovely human beings, okay? And they are here to help, help you in that model. Um, but if the other story is resonant and you're in transition, you know, like I was from one story to the next, then you can do it. 
Because the mindset I have found is the most important factor. And the patients who were ambivalent and afraid of coming off medication were the ones that ultimately we ended up putting back on medication. Um, you know, my orientation is I don't prescribe new psychiatric medications to patients for any reasons uh, under any circumstances. So the holding pen that I create is one where you don't enter it <laughs> unless you're, you know, you're committed to this level of consciousness, right? So you, you want to work with someone if you are working with someone who is on that page, because otherwise you're getting a lot of mixed signals like if it gets tough, you end up back on meds. You know, I've only ever known one other psychiatrist, Dr. Peter Bregan, um, who feels the way I feel about medications and who can hold this space. So the mindset is the most critical ingredient, the beliefs. And I actually could, could talk endlessly about studies that, that support this perspective, that particularly in psychiatry, your beliefs about medication are the most important determining factor of what it does, including your beliefs and fears called the nocebo effect of what happens when you stop taking it and how that can actually make you struggle and suffer even more if you believe that you're losing something you need, right? So I, um, you know, the, the book is a, I actually have gotten a lot of feedback amazingly already um, including in my, uh, I was just in Kundalini teacher training. I was graduating this weekend and, and I had a woman come up to me and she said, you know, I use your book to get off of Lexapro. I was on it for five years. I was like, Oh my God, that's amazing. You just saved yourself thousands of dollars, you know, being my patient. That's pretty cool. 1295 or whatever the book costs. Yeah. So, uh, I thought that was pretty cool that this is something you can implement, implement yourself. I do have a course coming out, um, in a couple of weeks called vital mind reset, which is intended to, again, prepare you to best come off medication and there will be a withdrawal support group and I've interviewed some important thinkers on the subject because I never was trained in psychiatric medication taper. None of us are. So you never will meet a psychiatrist who's trained in this. Uh, I know everything that I know uh, from patients and clinical experience. So, uh, and I know that it can be a very, very, very challenging process. And so you want to, you want to do it very mindfully but it's, it's possible, it would be wonderful to work with somebody supportive because so many psychotherapists, like you said, are just gatekeepers to the pharmaceutical industry. You know, they just create customers um, and it's unfortunately, you know, how they're positioned. So you want to work with maybe a naturopath or a functional medicine doctor um, who is supportive of your doing this and you want to prepare your body, I believe, first uh, so that you have more resiliency when you cause the kind of stress that coming off these medications can cause because there's a birth canal for most of my patients at the end of that process where you want to really be in the best shape of your life um, so that you can engage it without fear, uh, right? Because there's so much stuff that's been uh, suppressed and compartmentalized by the type of uh, consciousness that is available to you on these medications. And, you know, I have patients who, you know, I don't know, come out of the closet, leave their husbands, move to Europe, quit their jobs, like radical changes. And it's not always, you know, unicorns and rainbows at the end of your last dose. It's, it can be a real birth canal. And, and just know that that's possible and, and let it happen because amazing, amazing, beautiful, profound uh, things are at the other end. And, and that's why I do what I do because it's, it's the most meaningful work I could possibly be doing uh, on the planet. And, uh, and I'm so grateful, you know, for the opportunity. We're going to make sure to put links to all of your stuff under here, because I think a lot of people are going to want to get your book and probably do your course. Um, I know that I know people who are still on, um, on depression medications, and I think it's really hard to kick them sometimes. Your, your body becomes Not only really hard, Nick, it's, it's, in my opinion, they are the most habit forming chemicals on the planet. I have never heard of somebody coming off of Oxycontin, alcohol, crack, heroin, or any other medication at 1% of the dose per month. I have several patients in my practice that that is what's required in order to keep them medically stable. I have never heard of such a thing. You wouldn't believe it if you didn't see it yourself. And now, you know, I see it day in and day out. So it's real deal for sure. I know. It's wild. It's wild. 
I mean, there's, so there's, there's like, there's a whole nother line of this conversation that I want to continue with. I want to do another talk because yes, I, yes, I, I, I want because I want to talk about, I want to go into some of the, you know, the shadowy kind of, you know, behind the scenes things that are going on here that might've also might've prevented your book from being on the news and, <laughs> and that might be controlling the conversation with regard to pharmaceuticals. But I think, you know, this, you know, for the purpose of this talk, I mean, this, so this was really meaty and I think that our people are going to love, you know, listening to this. I think for a lot of people, it's probably going to give them a little bit of a wake up call. Um, is there anything else you would, you would add to this just, just on the chapter of depression for this, for this particular talk? Yeah. I mean, for me, first of all, it's so exciting to be speaking to an audience like this and of this level of consciousness, because, you know, I'm often either speaking to, uh, conventional doctors and, and audiences or um, sort of speaking to the, you know, sort of health community, alternative medicine community, where there's a general idea that these principles of lifestyle medicine are critical, um, but not for mental illness, right? So it's like sort of bringing, bringing psychiatry out of the, you know, catacombs and, and into the light uh, where the rest of um, medicine has been, uh, I don't know, putting Parkinson's, MS, Crohn's disease, cancer, and all these things into radical remission through dietary change for many years, right? So I'm just putting psychiatry into that uh, fold. I mean, I would say the only other sort of meta point that I often like to make is that the signal of depression, for example, um, can, can represent many different things. And so the spectrum is like, you know, I focus a lot on physiologic imbalance because I think so much of what we are calling depression is really what's called evolutionary mismatch, right? Which is that we're not meant to swim in 100,000 unstudied chemicals. We're not meant to eat processed food-like products. You know, we're not meant to drink fluoride every day. Uh, you know, we're not meant to have no sun exposure, sit all day, you know, and, and you know, go to sleep with our television blaring. So, so the, what's, what my friend Alan Logan calls paleo deficit disorder, you know, so this can manifest like many things that look psychiatric and can earn you a prescription if you're working with someone who doesn't know to ask certain questions. But they call, these problems in the environment cause things like thyroid dysfunction, cause things like autoimmune diseases, cause things like nutrient deficiencies like B12 or food intolerances that activate your immune system like wheat or dairy. Um, you know, medications that we take can cause psychiatric symptoms like birth control or painkillers or antibiotics. And so all of these um, problems aren't often acknowledged to be psychiatric in nature and they really often are, right? Like you have a thyroid problem and you have depression. No, they're the same thing. They're both coming from the same place. Depression is not a disease. It's not a disease. It's, it, you know, it doesn't behave like a disease in any of the ways we have come to categorize diseases in Western medicine. So we have to look at it as a syndrome and really as a symptom, right? So it can be physiologic or it can be psychospiritual. You know, it could be a message that you're mismatched with a, your a primary partner, you're mismatched with your career, you haven't come into alignment with what it is that you're here to do on this planet, or you're having community deficiency, you don't have that tribe, you're not waking up to many eyes every morning, you know, and, and there's something about it that just feels wrong, you know, many people would argue the the depression that we're struggling with, you know, I just had lunch the other day with um, Marianne Williamson, and she has a book coming out on depression. And, and her perspective is one that makes sense to me, like, it actually only makes sense that we should be feeling depressed. <laughs> you know? yeah. But like, it's like, you know, no sign of health to be adapted to a sick society, right? So um, there are many different layers, but I often focus a lot on the physiologic layers because they're easy to fix. They're often easier to, to address and engage than, than these other bigger picture layers, which only I think become easier once you have that uh, feeling of inhabiting, inhabiting your body um, in a way that you can trust. For those of us who have kids, including you, do you feel like there's um, there's hope? Do you feel like that this is going to get better? Do you, do you feel like there's there are signs that we're starting to sort of take meaningful steps in the other direction? So this is such a big question because if you had asked me this um, in like August of last year, I would have yeah. said, you know what? No, yeah. I don't, and and I don't know what to do, and. There are many days where I feel a level of hopelessness. I never, I've actually never struggled with depression in my life. I'm much more like an anxiety prone type of person. Um, but I touched, you know, depths of despair, you know, in that time that I, I, I never thought in my lifetime I would lift. And then I had these two beautiful kids 
you know, who are healthy <laughs> because I've never engaged Western medicine with them. Um, but, but what's going to happen, you know, when the rest of this earth is disgustingly falling apart and everything, you know, from genocide to planetary decimation is, is just coming like a runaway train in our direction. So something shifted for me. Um, I wrote about it actually in a, in a blog I called, um, beyond the yeah. ego it was about sacred activism. Right. So, so it's just the shift that happened for me where I began to see no, this is all part of it, right? Like it's the meta picture for the micro picture we've been talking about. It's like, this is this darkness I feel is actually part of the process. It needs to be this way. Stop fighting it. And that doesn't mean I can't continue to be an activist and share you know, what I think is true, uh, but it, it can't be from a place of having to win the conversation and fight big pharma. It has to be from a place of, I know it sounds cheesy, but a place of love. It has to be from a place of connection and trust and a sense that, you know what? There is no bad guy. There is no bad guy. We have all co-created the situation. I have been just as participatory as the CEO of Merck in creating a community consciousness, collective consciousness that has allowed for this reality. So guess what? That means that if I begin to shift myself and connect to a trust in a greater arc, then just my doing that, you know, the concept of morphic resonance, you know, just my doing that makes it more possible for other people to do it. That's quantum physics. That's what Rupert Sheldrake has, has demonstrated. And I love that because it takes the burden off of me to have to change the planet, right? All I have to do is wake up every day and work on connecting to purpose, work on, you know, coming from a place of deep, deep gratitude. For the beauty in this experience, which by the way, is still very available to us. Just like get out in nature for 10 minutes and you'll feel it. Um, and, and, and I have called so many amazing people, yourself included, into my life since this shift. I can't even tell you how much my life has changed since just this little tweak in awareness. Um, and again, I would plug Charles's book, The More Beautiful World Your Heart know, Knows Is Possible, was very instrumental for me to see things from a different perspective because I'd really been in a warring posture up until that point. And now, you know, I just feel totally differently and I'm probably much more effective if that's, you know, even a lens we want to look through um, in terms of spreading truth and awakening people to, to a different kind of truth than I ever would have been coming from that energy. So I actually do feel hopeful and I think that our kids, I'm sure, you know, yours included, are coming in already pretty awake, you know, they're like ready to roll yeah. and if we don't interfere, they're going to help us understand where it is that we need to go and, you know, it, it can absolutely be beautiful in ways we can't quite imagine at, at this point, but we, we, like he says, we know, we know are possible. I love that. It, it needs to be this way. Stop fighting it. I'm just going to have that like, you know, it written on my wall for the rest of the week. Yes, right. <laughs> True. True. For the big and the small picture. Totally. Yeah. Kelly, it's been amazing talking with you today. Oh my gosh. Total pleasure. I told you. We're going to be talking about a lot, a lot of other things in the future. And uh, I'm sure that. I'm really excited to hear from you. Awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know what a busy man you are. And I'm so honored to, to you know, have the opportunity to communicate with your, with your tribe. So thank you.